So meeting commences 9.03. Don't know where Alicia is. She was here a second ago. Is she on the phone? We can start anyway. Um, so councillors, we'll um, start the meeting. We have an apology from Councillor O'Neill. So I'd like to move that apology. Moved by Councillor Petty Young, seconded by Councillor Pauline Young. All in favour? Against? Carried. Um, no leave of absence. Confirmation of minutes. Would someone like to move the confirmation of the minutes? Moved by Councillor Petty Young, seconded by Councillor Pauline Young. All in favour? Against? Carried. Um, are there any conflict of interest declarations, councillors? Chairman, on 6.5 today, um, there's a mention of RPS as being a consultant to the council in the preparation of the report, but I did run it by the city solicitor as I have previously. Um, just for the council's information, I did receive $675 from them way back in 2011, and given the length of time and um, the low value of the donation, the city solicitor suggested there's no need for a declaration. And I've made them previously, but I would tend to agree with her that it's wasting everyone's time, really. But I put it out there in case anyone feels differently. Uh, we welcome Councillor Patterson. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, yeah. Councillor Vorster. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Chairman. Uh, I note item 6.2 on the agenda, which I think concerns um, the Nexus or Nexium development at Palm Beach. Um, for Council's information, uh, at some point, I think about a year ago, my parents contemplated um, purchasing a unit at that development. Uh, they did not proceed to sign any paperwork whatsoever. Um, and have since resolved to remain at their very pleasant Carrara townhouse. Um, anyway, I just thought I'd bring that to everyone's attention in case they felt as though my parents had an interest in the matter. Mm. Mm. No. Was it because of the site setbacks and site cover, or was it for another reason? Um, okay, that's very helpful information. I think we're all in a great, furious agreement. There's no conflict. Um, councillors, I'll just also mention that in relation to 7.1, um, we are dealing with uh, natural areas acquisitions. Um, so traditionally, I've had a conflict that relates specifically to one parcel in the north of the city. Um, the officers have advised that there's no um, information or discussion or change of circumstances in this report that will deal with that site. So I don't, again, for that reason, don't intend to make a uh, declaration. Uh, so, councillors, we have a number of starred items. Did anyone want to unstar any of them? No, thank you. Great. Councillor Gates. Sorry to disappoint you, Chairman. 6.1 and 6.5, please. 6.1, 6.5, yep. Councillor Owen Jones. I was going to move the start items. Okay, any other unstars? Otherwise, we have 6.2, 6.3, 6.4, 6.6, and 7.1. Moved by Councillor Owen Jones, seconded by Councillor Peter Young. All those in favour? Against? Carried. Uh, we also welcome Councillor Bowden Lumsden. Great to have you. Uh, we'll go back to item 6.1, councillors. Uh, Councillor Gates, did you want a presentation or did you have some questions or what would you like? Uh, I, if, if everyone else is comfortable, I don't believe we need a presentation, but I won't be supporting this application. And I did have some questions about 
um, some of the, the specifics. Um, I, I was concerned really about the um, 20 centimetre setback where the garage is basically built to the boundary. And I know that the report suggests there's only a small window above it, but um, it, it concerns me that the, the things referred to in this report talk to the average building height, for example, and that it is basically becoming um, what's expected in the area. And, and I don't think that's correct. So... Maybe, my, well, Councillor Gates, maybe we'll just have a quick presentation just to... Because count, people might not be... Across, across the... the okay. questions that you're raising. Right. So, and we can just put some pretty pictures up on the screen to help us out. So Thank you. Do you want to just have a quick fly-through? Impact assessment for a dwelling house, including partial third storey, at 13 the Lido Surface Paradise. The subject site is located within the low density residential zone and has a total site area of 516 metres squared. The site is currently vacant with the exception of a pontoon. The site is adjoined to the north and south by dwelling houses. The local area is predominantly low density residential zoning with the streets adjoining Bundle Road being zoned for medium density residential. The character of the area comprises of large scale dwelling houses. The site is not located on the building height overlay map. Therefore, the height limit is prescribed by the zone as being nine metres and two storeys with a partial third storey. As shown on the screen, it is important to acknowledge there are a number of dwelling houses with partial third storeys that are exceeding nine metres within the local area. The largest dwelling identified is on the same street as the subject site with a maximum building height of 13.6 metres the average building height of the dwellings with partial third storeys is 10.4 metres. The proposed development is for a dwelling house with a partial third storey. The application is subject to impact assessment as the proposal exceeds nine metres in height. The proposal seeks a maximum building height of 11.54 metres due to the sloping nature of the site. However, when will present to the street as 10.8 metres. Please note Sorry, that and that's that's as lodged though, not as conditioned in the... Correct. Yep. Um, please note that the following floor plans show the canal on the left-hand side of the screen and the road frontage on the right for a south orientation. This is the ground floor plan, um, which is made up of predominantly all the living areas, um, kitchen, butler's pantry, laundry, outdoor room and a bedroom. The second storey contains all the bedrooms, all of which have en suites and walk-in robes with a study. And the third, partial third storey, has a living area and a bathroom. A total of 12 submissions objecting to the development were received during the public notification period, consisting of 11 properly made submissions and one not properly made submission. The location of the submitters is shown on the screen, noting that multiple submissions were received from a singular address. The key matters raised were height, shadowing and privacy, site cover and setbacks, built form and scale. In relation to building height, the submissions raise concerns with the overall height of the partial third storey and the resulting privacy and shadowing concerns being out of character. As shown previously, there is an established character of larger dwellings and partial third storeys that exceed nine metres in height within the local area. The average building height of the dwellings with partial third storeys is 10.4 metres. City officers have recommended an amended drawing condition be imposed to reduce the floor to ceiling heights by 300 millimetres from three metres to 2.7 per floor resulting in an overall reduction of 900 millimetres. This will have a maximum building height of 10.64 at the rear and presenting to the street as 9.9 .9 metres. This will ensure the proposed height is consistent with those partial third storey dwelling houses within the immediate locality. The amended drawing condition will reduce the building height and will result in shadowing that is generally consistent with a nine metre development. Condition three is recommended to be imposed to install privacy screen to the partial third storey balcony openings on the north and southern sides to prevent overlooking. Submissions raise concerns with the site cover and proximity of the garage to the southern boundary. Whilst the site cover of 55% is exceeding the acceptable outcome by 5%, the proposed site cover is in keeping with the established character of larger dwellings within the area and considered appropriate. The submissions raise concerns with the 200 millimetre setback of the garage to the southern boundary. The proposed section at 200 millimetres is limited to a nine metre length that contains the garage and the laundry with no windows. 
The southern property contains only high set windows and therefore the reduced setback is considered to not adversely impact on the amenity of the adjoining property. The amended drawing condition will reduce the overall height of the garage and the laundry by 300 millimetres, further reducing the impact on the adjoining property. The reduced setback is considered appropriate as it will ensure the eaves and gutters are wholly contained within the site, not adversely impact on the adjoining amenity and be consistent with other properties within the Isle of Capri area. City officers acknowledge submissions raise concerns with the setback encroachment into the waterway setback. This slide shows the ground floor plan superimposed over the aerial mapping to demonstrate the extent of the development's encroachment. Officers within the hydraulic and water quality assessment team assess the development and consider it appropriate as it is an unenclosed structure, does not impact on the hydraulic performance or the ability to maintain the revetment wall, and all habitable rooms are located behind the 8.1 metre line. This figure shows the proposed development is generally consistent with the encroachment of the neighbouring properties to the north and the south and considered to be appropriate as waterway views from adjoining properties are still achieved. In summary, through the recommended conditions, the proposed development is considered to be maintaining the building height and the encroachment into the waterway setback observed within the local area. The application is recommended for approval subject to conditions. Are there any questions? Thank you very much. Okay, um, so we'll just go to Councillor Gates first, Councillor Young. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I guess my biggest concern is that um, what's been allowed previously has become the average in this location. And if you read um, the strategic outcome that's desired, um, it suggested in the low rise, the low density area, that um, properties are less cluttered and characterised by a feeling of openness with buildings positioned in a generous landscape setting. And I guess that's not what we're getting these days. Um, and so I don't understand how, because it's impact accessible, I thought you had to refer to the strategic framework and how officers can align what's being recommended with the strategic framework that has that suggested outcome for the low area. So is it simply because concessions have been made previously and it's quite clear on the overhead that the properties to the north and the south have a, a very large site cover too but I was also concerned and you might give me some guidance why there's a um, a willingness to accept the six metre setback to the water for all of that outdoor area rather than the the 8.1, I think it is, that's required. Because it does impact on the neighbouring properties when those sort of concessions are agreed to. So what, why, are we, why are we allowing the level of development on this block simply because of precedents that are set? I'll just forward through to this one here. So the waterway setback line is shown there in the red line. Yep. Um, so due to the design and the orientation of the site, the development sort of, I guess, angles away from that setback line as such. Um, so you can see there that the pinch point is 6.9 metres for the outdoor room and 7.9 metres for the, the northern corner of the outdoor room, um, noting that the waterway setback is 8.1 metres. Okay, um, and so can you show me the, the driveway as well? Because the, the blocks... Move off that screen. The, the extent of the non-compliance to a strict eight metres is only that slim triangle I can, that's... I can see what... Yeah. I can see that on the uh, screen. Um, no, but the the slope of the block or the... If you show me the overhead for the yep. driveway... And the widest section is 5.6. What's the narrowest section there? And I'm thinking about cars spilling onto the street here that might not fit. How, how long do we need for a car to park in front of the garage? Um, the cars are proposed to be parked inside the garage. Well, I know that, but it's a very big home and there's likely to be more than more cars than fit in the garage. Mm. You need five metres. So what's the distance between the shortest... Um, I believe it maintains that setback. Let's see if I can find it in here. Oh, 
We don't know. So it's a bit tricky on page 119. It's got what appears to be the average at the centre of the garage at 5.06. And through you, Mr Chair, it looks at page 149, it looks like it's 4.617 to the outermost projection, if you look okay. at that plan there. Okay, and, and the other concern I had, and I agree with the, um, the submitters, is shadowing. Um, I, do, I just don't, I believe this is an overdevelopment of this particular site at 500 odd square metres. So that's as much as I'll say, and I'll just let you know I won't be supporting it. So can we just bring up the aerial photo again? Of the waterway setback, sorry? No, just of the whole, the straight, the aerial shot. I mean, the problem is, you can just go back one. I mean, you can see what the neighbours to the south have done, Councillor Gates. Yep, I They can. put themselves right up against the boundary and their pool right up against the boundary. They're within the waterway setback themselves. I get and that. And now they're bearing some consequences of someone who's seeking to do probably something even less significant in terms of an encroachment than what they have done. So... I don't know that it's less, but the fact is that the more and more we approve these, the more they add to the average that gets presented to us in a report when quite clearly it's not the intent of the strategic framework to have such overdevelopment of these sites. And I, I mean, I, I don't think that one to the south probably came before us. It was probably just shifted through. So I guess my query has been today, how do we get to this point where the average of over 10 metres becomes the reality rather than the nine metres that people actually expect. And, and we keep chipping away at it. And I'm not trying to debate, sorry, Chairman, in questions, but if we keep on going, we'll end up with 11 metres being the average. So I, I just don't know where we stop with the, the partial third story and the reduced setbacks. I mean, 20 centimetres is that. And if there is a there is a top story window there, because I drove by to have a look, and if someone sneezes getting out of their car, the people next door will hear it. Uh, and so that's happened first, and the other one's happened second, and this is the third one. And I just worry where we land at the end if we just keep going. So that's as much as I have to say. Uh, thanks, Chairman. I'll just stick to a question. Uh, thanks. <laughs> well, well, I'm tempted to speak to the item, but I'll just stick to a question. Um, I am not familiar with the area, and I don't know what the purpose of the 8.1 metre waterway setback line is, so could that be explained, please? What purpose does that... Through the Chair. Um, the waterway building setback line is a line from the waterway yeah. um, and that's to ensure that the hydraulic performance is maintained and the revetment wall can be maintained as well. Um, so our hydraulic officers have reviewed that and consider that the encroachment for that small triangle there um, won't impact on the hydraulic performance or the ability to maintain the revetment wall. Where, if I might. Through the chair, correct. So where is the revetment wall, please? Um, yep, so the, more or less what the property boundary. Three, Mr Chair. It's more the, probably the line of the sand, if I guess as a rough guide there. Thanks. Um, would, if they were intended to put a swimming pool in Day, would it be able to be put into that um, zone or would it have had to have been part of this application? Uh, through the chair, they have the ability to lodge an application after this development, um, but they haven't, intent, haven't shown any intent to do so with this development. Through you, Mr Chair, but it is likely that a swimming pool could be put within that 8.1 metres. Um, Without compromising any of the um, flood zone because ultimately still be within the existing land form as such. They just scoop it out. Yeah, um, within reason. So you wouldn't be able to sort of, I guess, hypothetically, you wouldn't fill up with, you know, soil that area with within the 
metres because you'd be taking away from the flood conveyance. So the pool would have to be um, probably lower than the, the floor of the house. Like the four neighbouring pools? Probably, yeah. So um, just a question. Mr Chairman, question through you to either or Mick or the or director, whoever wants to have a stab at it. But I want to come back to, I guess, one of Councillor Gates' points is that time and time again, we have councillors raise their concern that by allowing a concession, it sets a new precedent. We then get the response that every application is assessed on its merit and that's not setting precedents. Yet we just had a clear, clear explanation on this one that precedents set from former concessions are now being used to justify an approval. So... I'd love a bit more comment on that, that we get told it doesn't set precedents, yet precedents accepted on neighbouring properties are going to be used to possibly approve this. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr Chairman. And I just want to thank uh, Councillor Gates for her contribution today and Councillor Hamill for his tangential question. Um, I think what's really important is that we have development that is sympathetic to the character of neighbourhoods so that we can reinforce all the good things about a particular area. Um, what was persuasive to me during this discussion is uh, your comment, actually, um, Councillor Caldwell, that this development with respect to the others nearby is probably more sympathetic to the rest of the street and doesn't push the boundaries, as it were, as much as that to the north and that to the south. Um, so while it may be at the upper end of what we might like to see at the site, it's certainly, to my mind, not the precedent setting development outcome in the neighbourhood because there are others that I think have crossed over that A-line, have built two boundary proper and probably represents a greater departure from, from where we should be at. So on balance, I, I don't, while this one probably isn't what we would like for the site, it's by no means the development outcome that's pushed us to this point and it's, it's within the realms of reasonableness. Um, so, yeah, I don't like bulky things um, at all. Um, I do have concerns about a development that tries to meet height limits on one end of the site, but on the other end not. Those things give me cause for concern. Um, but because city officers have come up with conditions that lower each of those levels by the 300 mil, we are shaving off nearly a metre of height. I think we've ended up in a reasonable place. And for that, I'm happy for the development to go ahead. Um, so I'm going to support it because I think that it's not an insignificant change in the context of those uh, that lowering of the height over the, over the three levels. And a metre, I think, satisfies some of the concerns that the neighbours have had. So I think that it's actually uh, has been a worthwhile exercise um, bringing it to committee to show that those changes have been conditioned. Yeah, and I think just to pick up on Councillor Vorse's point, if, if but for the fact that this was actually over height, it wouldn't have come through a planning application process at all and probably there would have been less scrutiny on things like the setbacks and how it presents to each of the boundaries. So the process has in my view, has worked and we've been able to make a significant change that I know um, Councillor Taylor and I had a meeting with the council officers prior to his heading off on his honeymoon um, and I know that he um, placed some value in the reduction in the heights, um, probably doesn't deal with all of the issues that he sees emerging in his neighbourhood, one of which I think is um, built to front boundary garages, um, which we're not seeing here. We're seeing a double garage set back from the road with with at least some capacity for cars to be parked on the driveway. Um, but certainly I think um, this one is pretty respectful of, of where it sits in the street. The setback to the third storey from the street is about 12 or 13 metres. So 
it will predominantly present to the street as a two-storey house, um, which I think um, also provides some value. So on that basis, I'm happy to support it as well. Anyone else want to speak for or against? Councillor Gates. Uh, thanks, Chairman. I, I do just want to speak against the approval. Um, I, my major concern is what becomes the next average that's put before, before us uh, and when more and more third, partial, third or partial third storeys are added, it's going to keep compromising, in my view, um, the aims of the strategic framework, which clearly says that, for, um, that suburban neighbourhoods are places of low intensity, low rise, predominantly detached housing, and that they're, they're less clustered and characterised by a feeling of openness with buildings positioned in a generous landscape setting. And we're certainly not getting that. And I think the likelihood of a pool is, um, is great. I mean, it's hard to imagine a, a home of this size without a swimming pool. So that will mean less space around the home. I'm concerned about the built to boundary garage. Um, I mean, I don't know how we um, assess the large development sites if someone gets in first and has a very limited setback, whether that then impacts on the next one. But quite clearly, it hasn't impacted on any decision here, um, which I would have preferred to see a greater setback applied for this third property in a row of three, because it is just a wall of concrete that will appear to the street. So um, it's not my usual form to, um, to vote against an officer recommendation in a suburban setting like this, but I think the shadings um, not acceptable. I think um, the setbacks are not acceptable, and uh, I don't like where it's heading. So um, I'll be voting against. Thank you, Councillor Patterson. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm not voting as I'm not on this committee, but thank you for the opportunity. Um, I share Councillor Gates' concerns, <coughs> and uh, with a a similar area with similar concerns in my division, uh, particularly with the, um, with the garage. Um, it's nine metre garage, effectively, because you've got the laundry. So that's not what I understood was that original intent of an increase effective carport or garage to the side. So we're, we're, we're doing something new by effectively allowing the laundry to go in there as well and be caught in that. Um, also, um, something that we've come up with and what I'm seeing practically for houses that were built 10 years ago and complying with the city plan, but if you look at this property, the, the reality is there is going to be a parking issue. There is no real storage in there. For a family of this size, they're going to have bunches of stuff that they want in their garage, plus two cars for the parents, plus whatever else for the adult children. Um, that concerns me. It also concerns me that there's nothing really in our city plan that enables us to ensure that people are building for their actual needs. Um, we are just effectively creating a parking issue for ourselves with that one. Uh, and then my other concern is with the partial st um, third story, my understanding was when these were first originally allowed, it was normally for a master bedroom or a small room on top. This is um, a very, very large portion of this house. It's not like a small partial story. It's two thirds at least of the size of the property. Um, so it's, it does occur like every inch is being taken at every angle. And again, um, <laughs> to iterate Councillor Gates's point, the Every reason we have heard here today about why this should be approved is not the specific outcomes of the city plan, which is what this is meant to be assessed against. That it is less clustered, characterised by a feeling of, of openness with buildings positioned in a generous landscape setting. That is what our, my, my understanding is what our bar or our measure is meant to be, and that is not what's being presented to us. Okay, anyone else? Councillor Paul and Thank you, through the Chair, and just back to uh, Councillor 
um, Patterson, who's um, very much speculated the type of family that's moving into the area, um, and saying mum and dad and adult children and all this sort of stuff is going to crowd out the street. That's not what we're here today to decide. I think speculating who's going to live in a house and how many cars are going to be parked there. And I think the other side of things too is we're not talking on the main thoroughfare and that we're talking in a local street, a local local traffic in a local street and um, the description of mum, dad, adult children, um, no street parking and all that sort of stuff. This could be a couple moving into this house whose children have moved away overseas and, and they have a dog to take for a walk and two Maseratis in the garage. So that's my speculation it could be. So I think putting that out there as the reason we should refuse something is not a planning issue. Thank you. All right. Uh, Councillor Vorsa, do you want to close? Um, <clears throat> only to say, Mr Chairman, that I think Councillor Gates has presented uh, a number of very thoughtful comments today that warranted discussion. And um, the fact that we ended up with this application through committee and ultimately council has afforded us the ability to properly critique it and support what I think is a very reasonable position taken by city officers and that is to bring down the height of the development to achieve an outcome that actually aims to meet the average in the street and not permit the average to creep up. So um, no one's happy out of this, no one's happy. But I think that's an indication that we've probably ran, landed in the right place. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. We'll take the vote. All in favour? Hey, Councillor Goes, did you want to? That's right. Um, in favour? Against? Carried. Uh, if we could name, uh, sorry, uh, record Councillor Gates and Councillor Hamill in the negative. All right, councillors, we'll move to item 6.5, which is the LGIP. You can volume two of your <coughs> agendas. Councillors, through you, Mr Chair, I just clarify with Councillor Gates that that smallest setback was 5063 in looking at the plans. From before. Councillor, do you want a presentation for LGIP? <laughs> All right, councillors will have a presentation. Five years. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks. We have five years, and ours is due to be completed and commenced by June 2023. So officers have been working hard reviewing the LGIP, the current LGIP, and have made some amendments. And those amendments relate to uh, the PIA, the Priority Infrastructure Area, and to uh, population growth projections. Um, to planning horizon, the time frame for the horizon, a number of other different various components, um, including financials too. And so we've had the, a state appointed review look at the draft LGIP. And so what we're finding now is that they're happy, they're saying we substantially comply with the requirements of the legislation. And so the next, the next step is to progress to state review. And so that's what the report is about today, it's to say, hey, endorse the, endorse the report to go, the, uh, the draft algebra amendment package to go to state review. There's been a couple of areas of non-compliance. Uh, the first one's technical. It relates to um, the priority infrastructure area and the capacity for growth within that area. So we're partially complying that we've got more than uh, 50, uh, 10 years of growth, but we have, because we can't do any other, because the city's a metropolitan and developed already to have capacity beyond the uh, statutory 15 years. So that's technical, and we've spoken with the state officers, and they're sympathetic to our rationale, and, and they understand this. They've seen it before in Brisbane. And the other one is about the planning horizon. So 
We're supposed so, to. Sorry, can you just explain how, how in real terms, there would be a line item that provides for something more than fifteen years? How how have we, how do we in real terms fall foul of that? Okay, so if we have um, something which, uh, for example, Gold Coast Water's got infrastructure that goes up to 2066, um, that should be technically up to 2041, which is um, about the planning horizon and, and it's beyond. But the reason why we do that, and am I, get, am I getting to the point here? Is this what you're, yeah, great. Um, the reason why we do that is because it adds to transparency, it's, it enhances our condition opportunities and it's a continuity of what we've previously done for LG Porn. So I guess, you know, the big question for us is how we pay for all this, okay? So yeah. where I'm getting to with that question is, you're talking about in this document, forecasting infrastructure and expenditure to pay for that infrastructure in a 15 year period that's actually to service growth beyond, well beyond that, but we're trying to jam the actual spend into a very short window of time. That's right, yes. Okay. However, um, the legislation requires us to only apportion that part that can be attributed to the time frame of the LGIP. So that brings, so we're not paying for the full okay, thing. Okay, so the payment, the, the dollar item next to that water infrastructure, for example, is only represents the 15 out of the 35 years of growth, for example. Yes. I'll just... Is that correct? I might just pass to Andrew. He's done the sums on this one. Uh, Councillor, just to clarify, um, priority infrastructure area represents 15 years, 10 to 15 years worth of growth, but the actual planning horizon for the LGIP is 21 years. So 2020 to 2041. So priority infrastructure area and planning horizon are kind of two separate compliance items. Priority infrastructure area is like a line that we draw that basically says, this is what represents our priority infrastructure area, but we can have projects outside of that line, if that makes sense. And then we have a planning horizon for the LGIP of um, 21 years. So they're two um, compliance items that are presented um, there, but state rec recognises that for both of them, um, well, sympathetic on the PIA because it's difficult to draw a line um, any other way for an urban um, consolidation area. And for the planning horizon non-compliance, for one network to show projects beyond that um, is just showing additional transparency, so they were happy in both cases. Okay, sorry, I hadn't read what the second point was. I was still just talking about the first one. I just, yeah, I just wanted to clarify. Thank you. Yeah, that's right. Cathy, did you... Um, the Oracle um, is coming out. I was younger, <laughs> much younger. You haven't lost it. You haven't lost All it. All right. So yeah, so in terms of the water and sewage infrastructure, we actually are required to plan to ultimate. Yeah. We include the infrastructure in our schedules of work and our map to show transparency for development if it goes out of sequence. We then have the ability to, to bring forward uh, charges and put, put on a bring forward cost. However, in the actual financial modelling, the financial modelling only includes the infrastructure up to 2041. Okay. So in terms of, you know, whether we can afford it or not, those 2066 infrastructure is not actually in the financial model, but there for transparency for developers and for, for my planners to understand whether we need to get a corridor, whether we need to condition on a development that's within sequence, but we need to put a trunk sewer through it at some stage in the future, we can actually condition then to have an easement through that, that development site. Okay. Thanks, Thank you. 
All right, so this is where we're at at the moment, just going through the steps. We're looking at, we're here today to request that we can go to state review. And um, so you can see where the yellow diamond is there. That's where we're seeking endorsement. And the next step, if we get endorsement, is to go to state review. And you, it's tight time frames to make the deadline of um, June next year. And so um, one of the key things that um, you might want to think about as a councillor, and you'd be across all of the projects or most of the projects that are in your divisions, is about how you might provide some more input into, into the LGIP, into the draft LGIP. So between now and public notification, um, there's a great opportunity if you want to work with the networks and with our team um, to see, um, to clarify, double check, make sure that you're, you're um, representing the, the community's uh, interest in uh, the timeframes and the content of the LGIP. Um, and then hopefully make a formal public submission to uh, Councillor Vorster, did you want to? Uh, oh, Mr. Chairman, I was, I was very happy for, for that last oh, sentence to be finished. Yeah, same. Um, so uh, I don't mean to interrupt, but I do have a question on your point. Far away, since we're at you now. Um, so I, I'm just interested in unpacking that suggestion because I, I feel as though throughout this process, councillors have been engaged through the speed dating workshops and what have, that we've held and the opportunities to be brief, that we've had input into the selection of projects and the sequencing of those projects. Um, I suppose my first question is, uh, when this does go to public notification, if there is a, a proactive ventilation of the LGIP2, to what extent can we respond to community feedback, which may not be which may be organised, let's put it that way. To what extent can we respond to that without jeopardising our financial assumptions and therefore our affordability tests? I mean, how genuine is our capacity to alter the LGIP in response to community feedback while meeting these deadlines? Um, obviously, if it significantly uh, varies from what we would um, have in the plan now and we do the sums on it and realise we can't afford it, then we would have to come back to council and we're going to report back to council anyway on the submissions, but re make that as part of the report is that it's um, now a different financial position. Mm. So I, I guess in the same way that the planning scheme has significant changes or non-significant changes that require re-advertising, does it have the same kind of process for this? Um, I'm not sure, to be honest with you, councillor. So we will do... a through the chair, um, we will do an assessment of, of any of the financial impacts. We will also check whether the changes are triggered by growth, which is a requirement for the LGIP. So those sorts of checks will, will be done as part of the submission process. We'll also be going back, if required, to the state appointed reviewer, who will will check those as well to make sure it still remains compliant with the Minister's guidelines and rules. So there will be steps that um, that will we'll go through to oh. vet some of those submissions. So, Mr Chairman, I just think it is so important that we manage community expectations through that consultation process. So, if, for example, we won't entertain any submission that's not supported by added information about population growth, that needs to be right at the front of that survey because I think all of us would have people in our communities wanting to champion a particular road upgrade which would not necessarily meet the tests of trunk infrastructure and would not be growth driven. So I suppose the point I want to make is we need to be very careful that we're not giving people the impression that they can guide our capital works program for the next 10 or 15 years to deliver an, a road upgrade, for example, that might be important to them specifically. So that that really has to be crystal clear. And uh, Mr Chairman, my other question, I suppose in response to the suggestion that we engage with our communities is perhaps through you to the director. Um, it would be super useful, I, th I feel as a community representative, that when we do arrive at the public consultation stage, and certainly after the LGIP is adopted, that there is a divisional overview which shows the projects that 
will unfold, when they're scheduled to unfold, and what they may entail. Now, I totally acknowledge that I can hop onto the interactive mapping service on Council's website, um, but that can be super cumbersome for people to use on a mobile phone device, so a lot of people aren't using it, and it doesn't, in my view, present an overview to my community that can comfort them that development will be met with supporting infrastructure. So perhaps as a communication piece, we could have a two-page summary for each division showing that what some of the major upgrades might include as our population continues to grow, with disclaimers, though. <laughs> really small font, is it, Peter? But, and look, maybe it's not a divisional thing, maybe it's a north, central, south thing, whatever, because obviously we drift in and out of different divisions, but I think a fact sheet of sort per infrastructure catchment would be super useful. Um, so, sorry. The most likely thing I could foreshadow, and I guess I'm just trying to work out whether we can stick to this timeline, is, okay, we can see there's a project there that's out to 2031, and the feedback is we think that should happen prior to 2026, say. Do we... So we assess that. We know the growth is there, but we think the growth is a bit later than what blah, 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 and we bring that forward. Does that... What's, what does that trigger in terms of the process? Paul, can I answer that one for you? Sure. Yeah. So if, at the timing of that, um, Councillor Caldwell, the, the timing of that is, is um, pertinent. So if that happens prior to public consultation, we can do some of that um, process work in terms of checking the financial sustainability of that before the need to make a formal submission. If you want to make a formal submission, if, if it ticks the boxes for um, growth, you know, it's triggered by growth, it's it's um, not a material impact, that kind of thing, then you would make the formal submission through public consultation, at which point we will pick it up when we go back to state review post-public consultation. So we might just also need to just work out whether or not we make formal submissions or not, because in traditionally we avoid making personal submissions to scheme amendments, etc. So maybe we get some advice around that approach. Um, if I can just say through you, Mr Chair, w this process for an LGIP is different to the city plan, to go back to your original question. So it is a bit different where typically with a city plan, we'll go out to the community, what's in it is quite broad. This is quite a technical document and typically in the past, I think with the last LGIP, we had a handful very of submissions, I think it was two or three, is that yeah. right or am I getting that Less right? Than 10, Less than 10. So we, we this process will be managed differently. We can certainly, Councillor Vorster, look into how we communicate it and send around to councillors before so you know exactly what's going out to the community and absolutely we will have to be saying to the community this is how items will be assessed. But when it does come back to council, as Paul said, we will say this is our assessment, whether we agree or disagree, and if it does fundamentally change the financial sustainability, that will have to be taken into account then. As for councillors making your own submissions, we'll, we'll just need to get some advice on that because typically in the past we haven't, we haven't done that. Okay, Councillor Owen Jones and Councillor Gates. Um, a, a not a dissimilar question in regards to our ability to advocate for a change so during the, the offline briefing we spoke about um, a, a park at Hope Island so uh, Hope Island is blessed with population growth but not blessed with any investment in the foreseeable future in regards to uh, uh, sporting activities and, and sporting parks so uh, Mr Chair yeah, you'll recall the Hope Island which is now called the Hope Island Sports Park um, which I think was previously the Village Green is currently in the 2036 cohort of investment. Um, and I suppose I'm interested in knowing how council laws can advocate for a change. And I appreciate that it may not be now, it might 
um, be a, a couple of steps away, but that would be for me a, an important uh, piece of kit that needs to turn up now, uh, now rather than in 15 years' time. And to put that into perspective, we hear a lot about population growth in the south and Palm Beach, but based on the modelling in this um, information here, the Hope Island population is going to increase by 30% more than the Palm Beach population in that same time without that type of investment. So I think it's, I think it's correct that we need to be able to clearly explain to the residents how difficult it might be to shift something because of the, the financial constraints and the population constraints, and I think that needs to be spelled out really clearly at the top of any document, but I'm, I'm really interested in how council laws can, can influence it without stepping over a line like we have had to deal with in the past regarding submissions for the plan. Through you, Mr Chair, Councillor Jones, I think for, for, from our side, from an officer perspective, there's some pretty um, detailed tests that we have to meet in terms of when we go up to the reviewer, when we go up to the state. So it might be that something that is put forward, we say, yes, that, that meets the test, or it might be that we say, look, it doesn't meet the test in these particular things. That might be a growth thing, for example. Um, at that point in time, as you know, it's always a councillor decision, but I think we'll clarify exactly what that process is. Uh, through you, Chair. Thank you for the question, Councillor Owen-Jones. Um, we're working with the Queensland Government Statisticians Office right now on the next set of um, state government population projections. They're expecting the detailed census information to be coming out around June this year, and then they'll kick off their process with us shortly afterwards, and we should have a new draft scenario uh, as early as September, October, hopefully, obviously dependent on their process. Yeah, just well, it'll be a draft sorry. scenario, so then it has to go through a review process and adoption. So we're probably not going to have a new set of population projections endorsed by council until early next year. And I don't know if this is coming later in the presentation, but it also is only based on city plan in its current form, not, for example, growth in investigation, investigation areas or the amendment two and three package coming through. So that will obviously right. put some growth in some of the inner north part of the city, which hasn't been contemplated in this current body of work. Yeah. That's, Councillor that, that's correct, Councillor. Due to the requirements for this modelling, we have to take the adopted city plan as our sort of starting point. Councillor Gates, followed by Councillor Peter Young. on this, which was really helpful. Just a couple of things. I did forget to ask about there was a five hectare park that we missed out on at Coomera and I simply forgot to ask the officers if they found a replacement uh, for that five hectares in examining the um, LGIP moving forward. Would, uh... And I'm sorry, Tony, because probably you weren't here, but there were three development applications at Coomera south of Foxville Road that contemplated in the first LGIP, a five hectare park. Um, it, they n never eventuated. We missed on the first one, then we missed on the second, and it was felt unfair to burden the third developer with the whole five hectares. So we got nothing. Um, there was, at the same time, an application for the International Marine Precinct, and that had a park dedication. That application's been refused, so we're not getting that park either. And I did mean to ask when I had the briefing um, whether there had been a replacement area contemplated for that parkland that we haven't been able to deliver. Through you, Mr Chair. Thank you for your question, Councillor Gates. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to take that on notice, but I will um, um, find yep. some time very soon to, to, to get your understanding of that process as well so I can come back to you with, a, with an answer very quickly. OK. And while you're there, talking to Councillor Owen-Jones' problem with perhaps the late delivery of the Hope Island Park. We mentioned yesterday that there's um, 
the item REC LR 0020, the Foxwell Linear Park West. Could you just throw us a page number on that, Councillor Gates? Um, page 96. It won't mean anything oh, to anyone else, but my explanation no, no, we, will on, explain. Sorry. Page 96. Page 96, and it's uh, five from the bottom. That park is that that is going to be very difficult to deliver because the state government has built a whopping big high school right in the middle of that proposed connection, which actually means that the whole linkage can't be delivered. So I would be interested to see if the officers, and is this possible, is it possible for the officers to review that? And if it can't be delivered, perhaps transfer the funding to the nearby Hope Island problem that we do have. It's a $3 million contribution and not until later, 2041. But if it's going to be impossible to now deliver that, um, it would make sense to take it out of the draft if, if we're able to do that. It's no point just having it sit there if it's impossible to deliver. Through you, Mr Chair. Um, thank you, Councillor Gates. I'll um, take the first question of that on notice in regards to the... Um, I was briefed quickly that this is a, a developer application, or a de sorry, to be contributed through the development process, but I wasn't aware of the information you just provided then. As far as the transfer of dollars, I believe that is possible. OK. Um, so, again, take that on notice and I'll come back to you with a response Well, on I'd that. just like officers to explore first whether something yes. can be delivered there. I don't yep. want to give something up if it, it can be yep. delivered, but I'm doubtful it can. It's along the Coomera River there all the way along and there's setbacks that, that vary from prior approval so, and some that don't exist. Thank you. Um, so, Councillor Gates, I am happy to, for us to pursue those items. What I think I would like to see at the end is that we ask the officers to keep a register of any councillor variations so that the officers can then report back to us at the next occasion and then give us an explanation that Councillor Gates raised the removal of the linkage park, mm -hmm. Councillor Owen Jones asked for the bring forward of the other thing and that all of those are accounted for in some sort of spreadsheet so that we can see what the unders and overs are and we can then have a, uh, a robust explanation as to why if the data doesn't support the change that's been requested we then have a way of explaining that to the community publicly mm. as to why it couldn't happen good call councillor peter young thanks chairman um my question was about the investigation areas which has been responded to already in mm. part but i just wondered about how we do factor in to lgip ultimately though those growth areas or the growth that might occur Please. And through the chats, uh, we'll be doing that in, in future LGIPs. So we are continually um, lagging behind. Obviously, you know, things are changing all the time with the city plan and the development fronts in the city, the actual development fronts. And so we're updating constantly um, and we're looking at putting in place a monitoring uh, so that we can assume yes or no, we do need to bring forward infrastructure in certain areas or push back in other areas. Or add. Or add if that, or take away if, if that's the case yeah. too. If development doesn't occur, <clears throat> thanks. Yeah. All right, do you want to press on? Yeah, thanks. Sorry. And um, just so that you uh, so that you get a grasp, and we've shown you this before. This is about what what's trunk infrastructure, what's not trunk infrastructure. Um, what it means uh, essentially is what can be funded through uh, infrastructure charges revenue. So infrastructure um, trunk infrastructure. It's required to service um, demand that's generated by new development, and it's identified in the LGIP. And there's other couple of um, ways that it can be identified, for example, with the conversion application, but we won't get into that stuff now. And examples there are, you can see on the table for water supply, you've got water pipes, pumps and tanks. And I've differentiated uh, public parks from land for community facilities simply because you can't um, spend as much infrastructure charges on land for community facilities. You can't charge for buildings. Um, Non-trunk infrastructure, it's, it's internal to a development generally um, and it can't be used to fund um, trunk infrastructure or other types of infrastructure. So can I just ask a question on that? When you say it can't be used to construct buildings, did you say? Libraries, for example. Just libraries? Um, or community centres, yeah, so the, the bigger just items. Picking up on Councillor Owen Jones's point, and I haven't looked at this closely, but um, at the Village Green, there's also supposed to be some kind of 
community centre supporting yeah, infrastructure. Yeah, earthworks right, and uh, so is that what the little green dot stands for? Yeah, just the earthworks two, to create the platform. There's two things. One is, is the earthworks for a community sometimes. Yes. And the other is supporting the earthworks. But the community something isn't provided for. So just fleshing that out publicly so that we get it on the record. Oh, can I just add to that, Chairman, that I mentioned at our briefing, I have raised this at the SEQ planning workshops that it would be helpful if we were able to pay for community infrastructure um, from LGIP funds as well as just land because it's a, a big constraint that we have. We get the land and then we've got no money because of the cap on infrastructure charges. So the two are related and both things have been put forward at an SEQ level for consideration for a change by government. <coughs> So, Councillor Gates, in general business today, I think we'll follow on this item with a discussion around infrastructure charges and LGIP funding, because obviously the key takeout that we're all aware of is what level of funding we actually have for this program and how we're going to make up the shortfall. So, um, I spoke to Alicia I won't be briefly. Here. I'll be leaving in a minute if that's all right with you, Chairman. Oh, that's fine. I've yeah, yeah. I'm just letting you know. That. Thank We're you. actually going to specifically deal with that as a broader issue. Okay. okay. Good. Okay. Right, Thanks, thank Paul. you. Um, just I'll add to that is um, the idea that you know there's some grey areas between what can be funded and what can't be. So, you know, how big a toilet facility can you go in the park without it turning into too big? So we're talking about scale of buildings. <laughs> You know, great. Yeah. So there's, sorry, the point is, is that there are grey areas and the officers struggle with these areas. And so within, um, over, over the history of the LGP regime, we've had different things allowable in there and um, we're not 100. Thank you, Councillor Thanks, Councillor Gates. Um, we just need to note Councillor Gates' departure and I, I omitted welcoming Councillor Toza to the meeting as a visitor. So thank you for returning to planning. So one thing there is that we do seek clarification from the state officers and it's never all that clear. So if you'd like to include that in the discussion, that'd be great. Um, <laughs> and uh, if there's some contact numbers for the officers in the infrastructure planning team. Any more questions? <laughs> no, um, but... Alicia, is it, is it confidential what the value of the infrastructure in this program is? And No. And is it confidential what our expected recovery and funding of that program is? Through you, Mr Chair. So if we got into our financials on funding, that would be confidential. The, the agenda item today is non-confidential. Um, there has been a change to Info Council, so although you do see confidential at the top of the item, that's meaning for the whole agenda because there is one confidential item that we had on today. Actually, yeah, I was just going to clarify that. So these, as I said, as Alicia just said, at the top they say receives confidential, but they're actually not confidential. Press post now. Um, so, what's the value of this program in total? Yeah, in that, in that present value, it's um, 3.2 over 21 years. Billion, that is, sorry. Yeah. Billion. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. <laughs> yep. Yeah, we do. Um, so, We've got uh, the water supply is uh, 57, but that's for the period, as I discussed before, it's a longer period, but we've we've taken some out. So let's let's be clear that, as Cathy said, we extracted the stuff that goes beyond 2041. Um, for sewerage, it's 1.39 billion. For transport, it's 1.16 billion. 
uh, for the parks and uh, land for community facilities network. It's six, uh, sorry, it's 614 million and for stormwater it's 143 million. Councillor Aaron Jones. Mm. We are able to use all of this information to try to explain to people during yes. the story. Yeah. Um, and then picking up on your earlier point, uh, Councillor Cole, well, what it doesn't do is it doesn't show the additional costs of actually providing the community facilities on the, on the ground. So there's almost an, an entire body of work over and above this, which also is part of the overall shortfall. If we um, so, if we want to have a discussion around council's capacity to f finance and fund it, we need to just move to closed. So, I don't know if there's any need for that discussion, but um, otherwise, we'll obviously get to that in due course. Any other questions, councillors? Okay. So, if we can just bring up the recommendation in relation to that item. And I think we'll just add a number four, um, which I think is probably the cleanest way of dealing with this for the time being, that a councillor register of suggested changes or a register of councillor suggested changes. I don't know. Do you want to? Yeah. be maintained. Just, I mean, I just think we should probably at the next decision point be able to reflect on what, if there are any ins and outs and where they've come from. And, and I suppose, uh, this is LGIP 2, so like, I mean, it's an ongoing process and we'll have an LGIP 3, which will uh, hopefully at some point in time reflect changes in population growth estimates and all of those type of things. Well, we might even have 2.1 if we're, I don't know what our plans are for a, an amendment to the LGIP midlife, but do we have any ideas on when that might, if or when we're going to do that, or would we just wait the five years? Every six months we'll do it. No, so on our, on our forward program, uh, through the chair, um, we've got, um, at the moment, um, lining up LGIP, we call it 2.1 slash 3, so depending on timing uh, as to when we get the updated um, um, census data and projections, as well as then um, the progress on major update 2 and 3, um, we'll come forward with another um, package of work. It, to put it into this one will be very difficult because even if we get updated data and we've got to model its distribution through the city, then we have to go back to the networks and do all the work around modelling those. <coughs> it's very difficult. So we've got to do it in a staged approach. And as Paul said earlier, that's part of the, the why we're always playing catch up because we might do amendments to city plan, then we have to do updates to the LGIP as well. So, yeah, it's what you see here is a, a significant body of work that will move through and then we'll come on the tail of it with updates for population and all, as well as potentially major update two and three. Councillor Jones. Um, and when, when we had the briefing yesterday, one of the observations was uh, in order to communicate this to the residents, what we are missing is the fact that the state of Queensland doesn't have the equivalent for their infrastructure networks um, and in particular trying to explain what work that we have to do on our road networks without being able to see what the state's same overlay plan for their main roads in particular um, makes it really difficult. So uh, when residents generally complain about the lack of road infrastructure, it's not really our network because our network actually has a 10-year plan or a 20-year plan. What is missing is the overlay and the commitment from the state to provide all of the major road up, upgrades and the, the Coombe Connector is one example of that, the Jabiru Island Bridges is, a, is another example. So we end up having to explain to residents that we're, we're almost blind 
to what commitment the state are prepared to make. Um, so I think that that's the really big, important missing part of this jigsaw puzzle. Uh, thanks, Mr Chairman. I just want to ask a series of yes or no questions, or rather the answers would be yes or no, I suppose. Um, do this... Uh, <laughs> 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 That's edgy. Um, first question is, through you to the director, perhaps, does the state government pay any infrastructure charges when they construct a state school on the Gold Coast? To you, Mr Chair, I don't believe so. Is that correct? No. No? So, uh, I've shortened that I don't believe so to a no. Okay. Um, so, Mr Chairman... You can broaden that question. So, Mr Chairman, through you to the director, uh, when the state government carries out... Um, infill development to deliver social housing somewhere on the Gold Coast, do they pay infrastructure fees? I don't believe so, no. No. Uh, Mr Chairman, when the state government constructs a hospital um, that induces demand on our local road network, do they pay infrastructure fees? No. So, Mr Chairman, I, I thought I'd just ask those questions for, for the very same reason that Councillor Owen Jones, I suppose, asked his. Quite often, we end up with this population-driven burden on our infrastructure caused by decisions that are wholly outside of our control. Um, you know, I had, on Maddox Road, for example, a uh, house knocked down and 12 units go up. I think they're under construction at the moment. Now, no one's suggesting that we shouldn't have an additional 12 units of social housing, but the problem was, because it is acceptable development under the Planning Act and the planning regulation, and Council's hardly a referral agency even under that assessment process, it's very difficult for us to begin planning for the delivery of community infrastructure because we actually don't know where the population's going to start popping up and we don't know where the state government will necessarily construct a school. So when we begin talking about the issues of infrastructure and population that affect us, I think it's really important that we all make it clear that the state government drives so much demand and takes very little responsibility. In fact, it shifts all of their costs onto the ratepayer. Um, Mr Chairman, a question through you to the director. Could you just confirm for me that the assumptions of population growth that informed LGIP2 did not contemplate the impact of the state government's proposal to deliver a satellite athletes village at Rubina? Through you, Mr Chair, no, I don't believe they did. All right, thank you. So I'll hopefully address that in general business. Thank you. All right, any other questions? All right, Councillor Hamill, question? Um, through you, Mr Chairman, just wondering how easy it is, so the officers gave the general dollar figures um, for areas, but can that be broken down further to if I wanted to see by a suburb or by, say, an industrial area to get an idea in a specific area what we're looking at? Is that yeah, yes. difficult? Yes, yeah. All right, I'll send through something afterwards. No worries. Councillor Paddy Young, did you have a hand up? I know we've got these uh, detailed tables of projected growth, existing and projected population and so forth. I wondered if there's anything whereby... I might get percentages of growth in in those um, identified areas. I might pass um, this one across to Andrew, Mr Chairman. Over the period of the audit. Through you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, the What's presented is what is required to be published under the LGIP guidelines, but if mm. you're um, requesting something additional to that, we could get that to you. can slice and dice it in many different ways. Okay, <laughs> like thanks, Jim. All right, someone would like to move that. Moved by Councillor Aaron Jones, seconded by Councillor Vorster. Do you want to speak to it, Councillor Aaron Jones? Are you happy with that? Take the vote. All in favour? Against? That's carried. Oh, it was just a... No, he was delivering... He was delivering up to 2036. That was the... Slight delay. Oh, 
plans. Because uh, I want to know about Country Paradise Parklands and Frascott Park. What's happening in Frascott Park? Well, we're actually you've just put, about delivered everything. No, no, we're actually now putting some soft fall treatments around the dog bowls because in wet weather the dogs dig up the turf, leading to. I know, but if we're putting a permeable soft fall around that infrastructure, we actually get better life out of the turf. It's good. Okay, so councillors, we'll just move on to general business. What happened? Um, I think. Mick has mm. circ Am I missing something else? No. no. Okay, so Mick has circulated the DA report, development activity report. So I'll move that we note that report okay. for October to December. Seconded oh, by Councillor Lawson. Second Can I just ask you, Mr Chairman, why is this always dealt with as a GB? Um, through you, Mr Chair, we've always dealt with it as a GB. I mean, we can always put a report up, but it's no, easy no, to just, just... No, no, I'm not, I'm not arguing for the, that. I yeah. just the work, the work is in the report, We don't, sorry, and in the yeah, this report, we don't probably need it to be supplemented with a repeat of the... And I think in the past, Mr Chair, we always just emailed it to councillors to Councillor Vorster. It wasn't necessarily something that we took through committee. Oh, good. So moved by me, second by Councillor Vorster. All in favour? Against... Carried. Um, what else were we going to talk about today? Through you, Mr Chair. Um, the other things we are going to talk about was just a quick yeah, update okay, on major so amendment two and three. <clears throat> do you want to do yeah. that now? All right, well, let's talk, let's talk about that next. So through you, Mr Chair, councillors, um, as you know, major amendment two and three was submitted to the state just before Christmas. Um, the state have, uh, they sent us in a pause notice uh, late December that was over the Christmas period. Um, that was completely expected from us. Obviously, they had a number of staff on leave and obviously resourcing as well. Um, it was paused at that point in time until the 14th of February, which was a couple of weeks ago. Um, on the 11th of February, we received another pause notice. So that's our second, our second pause notice. Um, the, that, that one basically goes until around the 21st of March. At that point in time, the Minister will then be a, will start reconsidering the timeframes will tick over again. In terms of information, we haven't received any huge concerns or there's been a couple of requests for uh, additional information, some that we had already provided. So we've re-provided re those, um, those items to the state. At this stage, I think we're uh, expecting a decision on the amendment in May. At, at this stage and then at that point in time we'll be coming back to council but again that those time frames are at, at the whim of the state government at the moment we've we'll continue to work with the the gold coast office um and if needed obviously let councillors know if we need to write to the minister so, so have they they haven't really because they've been piggybacking the notices they haven't really at any point had any significant period of time actually run for their Assessment, for their assessment, that, right? not really, just the time, obviously, between each pause. Yeah. Um, so, so at this stage, where where we believe that we would still be on track for a July a commencement of the amendment package, um, but again, we'll update council if we believe that that will will be slipping. I think. Okay. So councillors will just keep Rich? an eye on that, but we'll know more on or before the yeah, we'll know of more March the as to whether the clock. Yeah has started to meaningfully run and whether they're actually undertaking their part of the work process. Okay, thank you. Um, the other, the other thing, let's just talk about Councillor Hamill's question next, which yes. was just in relation to the um, the height, for example. The, the, the precedent. I don't know if Mick wants to come out for this one just to talk about the precedent. So uh, through you, Mr Chair, Councillors, Councillor Hamill, you were right. So absolutely, when we do the assessment, we assess on merit. So I think what came out in that report was the provisions in the strategic framework that relate to the character of that particular area. And that's when the officers are looking at character and we're assessing that and Mick and I are obviously reviewing those reports too. Um, the character is the character. So it may, um, Mick, you might want to uh, step in here as well. It may seem like a precedent matter, but it is probably in those situations purely going to the character. Um, but during the assessment, the ab absolutely confirmed the individual DAs are being assessed individually on its own merits against those provisions of the city plan. 
Not so, there's any. Um, just quickly before you jump in, Mick. So I, I appreciate that, but the character that was used in this report is by stuff that's been approved, that's had yeah, concessions yeah. to it. So we are establishing the new character by allowing concessions to occur and letting that creep yeah, understand. go on with it. Um, so I appreciate it's not a perfect art with it, but just that was the first time I've heard an officer use precedent in their response mm. like that. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, whereas I think at nearly every full council meeting, there's some councillor from somewhere raises about it, about being concerned about raising a precedent. Um, and that's exactly what it, it does in that there. We won't refer to that property and say, because of what happened at X or Y, but if we're going to refer to the character of a neighbourhood and it's through allowing concessions or relaxations on certain things that we're establishing that new character, then we do have control over it. So either we do or we don't. Or, or what level of control are we prepared to have on it? Um, through you, Mr Chair, I think in this particular case as well, um, the officers had listed a number of um, houses in that street and that locality that were obviously above nine metres. Um, um, I think a good portion of them, I couldn't tell exactly how many, um, were approved probably under the old 2003 scheme where the height was 11 and a half metres for a dwelling, I believe. So you've got that that forming part of the character of the area, um, which to me is more, I guess it's not the same as precedent. Um, you have to have regard to um, the character. And certainly if we refuse that application, um, I think that's what you'd, the court would probably um, give some weight to as well. Um, so under the Planning Act, there's relevant matters and the character of the area would certainly be a relevant matter that um, you'd have to have regard to. Just that, Mr Chair, I know I voted against it in the end and I was very close to being the other way in it because I think the reduction of the height and a few other parts was fine. It just, and maybe it's something for that officer to take on board, but that response of talking to precedent set through what's in there and the way the response was answered to probably doesn't really line up with the response from the manager and we want to be careful on that. Yeah, I mean, to me, a precedent is something that is followed without any regard to anything outside of that in future consideration mm -hmm. of for decision so it would immediately mean that you make that decision again because of that decision yeah. which is clearly not the case so i think mr chair it also explains too that in other areas where we see after city plan changes and say a height is reduced and all of a sudden members of the public think that we're going to go hard line on that new height well we have something in the legislation that says we have to take a character into context as well in some areas so it's not it's not as simple as just because there's been a reduction in height. You know, you could could use old stuff that's already in an area to help approve something. Yeah. And three, Mr Chair, just to complicate it more, um, there's no sort of hard and fast height in the suburban neighbourhoods in the low density zone um, as there is in the urban neighbourhoods and medium density and, and high density zones. Um, in those areas, we haven't yet, to my knowledge, approved anything that's gone over the 50% because it's a different sort of criteria so um it's yeah it's even just in here we had a height reduction it used to be 11.5 now down to nine and we're allowing previous heights in there so just because it now says in the mapping nine in this area's code doesn't mean that it's going to be anything above nine it's going to be an automatic refusal and councillor hamill this um where we've landed on some of these big houses has been informed by multiple cases that have been taken to the p &E court where there's been significant examination of where we should land on them and if I was to draw a line somewhere above the nine metres that is probably is a fairly comfortable average it's around about the 10.4 10.5 so you know the officers probably in their thinking maybe isn't strictly where they're going, but from my thinking, a defensible decision lands somewhere around that as being what is above nine, but not a crazy height in a suburban area. Councillor Owen Jones. And I'm assuming that character rests in the context of the immediate, so in this case, we had seven or eight submissions immediately adjacent where the as just as a lay person, I wouldn't have thought the character of what was being applied for was too substantially different to the existing houses around. And I know that we've had that in the past with some of the huge things that have been built 
and sovereign islands, you know. So uh, that's the bit that I always struggle struggle with in terms of it, character is very subjective, but it's all it's always strange when there are strong submissions against something that doesn't look substantially different in my mind to to existing um, houses in the street. Okay, so then, um, Alicia, do we just want to have a little discussion about moving forward on the LGIP and how we fund it? So, I mean, it might be useful, do you think, just for us to go to close so we can talk about those if, hardcore if numbers? because then we can get... <coughs> Moved by Councillor Pauline Young, second by Councillor Owen Jones. From the far left and the far right. Um... All right, so we'll move to close because we're, we need to deal with a general business item that will um, talk about the, the local government budget. Uh, impact on the city's budget. So that's the reason for moving to closed. All in favour? Against? Carried.
again if you want to turn the viewing on for both of those people at home. Yeah, I don't I think <laughs> I might be otherwise occupied today. So. Um, okay, so we've got a motion there. I'm happy to move. Second by Councillor Vorster. Uh, probably don't need to speak to it. We'll take the vote. All in favour? Against? Carried. Um, Councillor Vorster, you had another GB? Uh, I did, uh, Mr Chairman. Um, or I should have that in our inbox. Basically, back to council to protect our lifestyle. Uh, yes, sorry, I just, yes, sorry. I just, mm. so now we're going to see all of the online shopping that's been done. No, that's no, second out. screen. Oh, that's clever, <laughs> clever. Amazon.com, your parcel is on its way. Easy as. Is, is there another address you'd like me to quickly send it to? growth driven congestion on our telecommunications infrastructure <laughs> so good our Laura Wayne network it's very edgy That's it. Glenn. <laughs> the trouble is we don't even have one presently on this working group. What's that? Yeah. Because I want to understand what the risks are so that we can make representations to ameliorate them. And if I have a second, or I'm happy to take some questions, I can explain what some of my concerns have been and what I've heard back from the Premier's office. Yeah, look, um, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, as, uh, as we'd all be well aware, um, QIC is a government-controlled um, enterprise that owns a significant amount of developable land around Rubina Town Centre. Um, the state government has indicated that they intend to deliver a satellite athletes' village uh, on their land um, that fronts uh, Lake Lido. Uh, ahead of the Brisbane 2032 Olympic Games. Um, Mr Chairman, the public release of those plans caused a significant amount of consternation in my community because um, it proposed a level of um, development intensity that wasn't ever contemplated in the Rubina Master Plan. And in chatting with these constituents, uh, what I reflected on is that there may be provisions under the prevailing planning instruments that afford the state government the ability to present large-scale developments to council
for approval, but with only 40 calendar days to assess them. That's just only one aspect of the risks associated with their proposed development. Another, of course, is that uh, there, may be, there may be access to infrastructure credits or an ability for the state government to pay no infrastructure contribution whatsoever uh, towards supporting that development. My big concern is that we end up with um, Rabina becoming the dumping ground of um, the state government's accommodation needs without there being a commensurate infrastructure dividend for the Gold Coast. And I think in the context of our LGIP conversation, if this development is to proceed by the state government, we need to have them subsidise as much as possible those infrastructure costs so that there are more funds available for infrastructure projects elsewhere in the city. Um, Mr Chairman, I wrote to the Premier in her capacity as both the ministerial shareholder of QIC who own the land, as the Premier and as the Minister for the Olympic Games. Now, the Premier didn't bother replying to me directly. I received um, a letter from her Deputy Chief of Staff and the Deputy Chief of Staff insisted that uh, Council was being engaged in discussions relating to this development. Um, when I then presented that letter to the Office of the CO asking for clarification, uh, it, it occur, uh, it's now evident to me that City Officers are meeting with their state counterparts, but to date I don't feel comfortable that the community's interests and aspirations are being represented in those discussions as early as they may be in the process. The purpose of this motion, Mr Chairman, is for a report, and it doesn't have to be war and peace, to be brought forward so that all of the Council can understand what some of the risks are associated with supporting an athlete's village at Rubina because they will have financial and infrastructure impacts on the whole of the Gold Coast. And secondly, what it attempts to do is to formally engage Council in the process of deciding as far as possible what is best for the Gold Coast at that site. And it achieves that by ensuring that Council will be consulted to inform and direct our city officers dealings with the state government. What I don't want to see, something that we saw with another project nearby, and I won't mention it because it was a closed item, where, you know, just days before we were asked to make a decision, we'd been presented with a fait compli. How do you pronounce it? A fait compli? Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah. We were presented with this, oh, by the way, city officers have been working for months and months and months and months with QIC. By the way, now you all have to vote for it. For me, that's unacceptable, and we need to be engaged right from the start, and we need to be setting the agenda. And, Mr Chairman, the purpose of doing all of this is so that we can then make formal representations to the state government that attempt to protect the ratepayer and community interests, because this site will be developed. We must all acknowledge that. But let's try and get a dividend for the city, because I'm very frustrated to hear the state government announce and shop around big infrastructure projects elsewhere when we're shouldering the burden of an athlete's village. Let's get our views on the record. That's good. I'm not sure if there was ever a planning, like a reporting mechanism that's been settled on how that... Huh? Well, for like, if someone, if a council officer is attending some sort of workshops, how were how were we going to find out about that? So, through you, Mr. Chair, I understand. I think the, I think Council of Orsa, you were at one meeting, then there was another one that officers were at. Is that is that the one with DA no, so, officers? So, or? so I had to solicit that meeting yep. to understand what was going on. But after I received the response from the Deputy Chief of Staff to the Premier, which I forwarded to the Office of the CEO and I won't name that officer, I received a reply from an officer to say that they'd been meeting with their state counterparts yeah. and shortly they would now be drawing in transport officers into those discussions. What the only offer made to me was to be kept in the loop with what was happening rather than an approach where the council would be engaged to help decide what we want on this marquee side for the benefit of the Gold Coast. So I want to change the complexion of the city officer approach by empowering council to decide what we want as a dividend from the games. Okay. So, Cathy, were there any lessons to be learned out of the um, Games Village at Parkwood? Yeah. 
So we don't want to make those mistakes again or have them made for us if we can avoid it. Yeah. So that was moved by Councillor Borster, seconded by Councillor Paul and Young. Anyone else want to speak for or against? Take the vote. All in favour? Against. Carried. Any other items of general business, councillors? All right. Uh, meeting closed at 11.03.